Now, just for a little while this evening, I want to look at the Eighth Commandment, um, which is uh, the shortest one. Uh, you shall not steal. And uh, you're all looking around at each other saying, do I think there's any thieves in here? Um, but we've said that with all the commands, haven't we? That uh, we can kind of tick them off at various points and think that maybe they, they don't apply to us. But I hope that we can maybe unravel a little bit uh, of this commandment and see what it means, not just for ourselves, but also for society. Now, we maybe don't spend, I, I maybe don't spend a lot of time. Uh, I think most of my preaching would be to, to the individual, uh, and a lot of the New Testament is written to the individual. But I think there's also a sense in which we see the commands broadening out and having a real important effect on the kind of society we live in, or the kind of society we probably don't live in, uh, to be honest. Now, I want to finish with a little bit of that, so I, I'm not going to get political. Well, maybe. A little bit. Um, but we see that the commands are kind of, they're, they're split, aren't they, into two? The commandments of God, the, the first half, uh, for at least the first four, are, are kind of vertically uh, oriented towards our relationship with God about how we think of Him, how we speak of Him, and how we worship Him, and uh, it exposes that we fail uh, so much. And so there's an element that the commands are there to point us to Jesus to save us and rescue us from our own inability to keep the commands. And that's very much part of the role that they play. So I think there's someone actually who's sitting in this building who uh, the first time I preached these commandments here, I uh, thought, yeah, I know this, this, and this. And as we went through them, uh, he recognized that actually he needed a savior and became a Christian. And that's part of the role of the commandments is to do that. But also when we become Christians and when we've got the power of God in our lives, then we find that they are the guidelines and the parameters for our Christian living. Um, and so that we've got the first section that look at God and our relationship with God, and then we've got the second table of the law, if you can call it that, which is more about our horizontal relationships. So how you relate to the person next to you in the pew, how you relate to your husband or wife, how you relate to your neighbor or your colleague, uh, how we relate to one another. And so they're about a protection of a relationship with God, and also the protection of our relationships with one another. So the commandment, the, the latter commandments, uh, highlight basic human rights um, and the protection of life, the protection of marriage, the protection of property, the protection of justice. All of these things come under uh, the, the rubric of these last commands, and God's concerned about that. And they're very far-ranging. They're only kind of um, summary statements from God which are expanded in a lot of places in the Bible, including uh, in the passage that we read today, tonight. But the Eighth Commandment is a, a basic uh, command against uh, stealing, which is about the protection of one another's lives and properties in many ways. Um, uh, within that, there's that underlying lack of truth, a lack of trust, probably involves, as it broadens out, lying and cheating and greed and insecurity in a lot of cases, and a lack of respect for other people and, and other people's property. Um, and stealing uh, is, uh, we see the, the antithesis of all these commandments in the nature of Satan and, and his destructive character. We looked at that this morning, that Jesus was the good shepherd, uh, and Satan is described as the thief who comes to steal, who comes to destroy. And so it's very much related to the destructive nature of darkness and of Satan and of, of hell, which is to disrupt and uh, destroy the unity of uh, humanity and of human beings. And anyone here, and I did mention this this morning um, without thinking about this evening, Anyone who has been stolen from knows that. If you've had things stolen from you, you know immediately 
that it sets you on edge. Who is it? Who did that? How did they know? Why did they do that? That's rather uncomfortable. Even though nothing's been stolen from your house, if you come home and the window's open and things have been disrupted, isn't that just an uneasy feeling, isn't it? That you feel violated. You feel that your property's been violated, that that space that you regard as your own has been taken. And, and there's a sense of unease and mistrust comes in to relationships when that is evident. So Paul in Ephesians is speaking about living as children of light. We saw this morning the picture of Jesus as the one who comes to bring life, and he is the one who brings life and light. So light is knowledge and understanding and spiritual uh, insight. And he brings that through his salvation. And he says, as Christians, we live as children of, of the light. So we've moved, remember we saw this morning, that you move from death to life when you become a Christian. Spiritually, you've moved from darkness to light. And so there's this movement in our lives, and it's an, it's an ongoing movement. It's an ongoing process that we're to live as children of the light. So there's a kind of transforming reality that is always happening in our lives as old ways get ditched and new ways get adopted in our life. So, uh, uh, living as children of light, um, we have a motivation to do so, we have a desire to do so because of what Jesus has done for us, and because we see, we begin to see that His, com His parameters for our living, the Ten Commandments, there's only ten, are for our benefit, they're for our good, they're for our blessing, both in our relationship with Him and in a relationship with one another, they're all about valuing life, valuing Him, and putting Him first. And we know uh, we need forgiveness, and we need to turn to Him again and again, but he, we find He gives us uh, the way of, of living. And it's interesting, in, uh, for example, in Titus, where uh, uh, Paul is speaking uh, uh, to Titus, or giving a letter to Titus, and, and passing on um, New Testament um, exhortations to the people. And w when he's talking about even slaves, now it wasn't that the New Testament was condoning slavery, but it recognized that it happened. And even slaves had to live as children of light if they were Christians. And he says, teach slaves to be subject to their masters and not to steal from them, because that was obviously what happened all the time. Very tempting it would have been too presumably, to do so, but to show that they can be fully trusted to make God, our Savior, attractive. So, there was even, there was an injunction even on, on slaves at that point to, to live in such a way that would make their Savior attractive by being, them being fully trusted. So, the whole issue about stealing is also related to the whole issue of trust. So, that in a a Christian community, there should be a really high level of trust. If there's a trustometer that we could put in the church, it should ring really high uh, in a Christian community because there should be a high level of trust and a high level of honesty, not just in our day-to-day -day dealings. Not in that sense you could put your handbag down, no one's going to steal it. We can hope that's not going to happen. But just in our honesty and our relationships and the trustworthiness with which we deal with one another which is related to this. But can I just go on to uh, speak um, about the specifics of this commandment, uh, do not steal. I think it applies at different levels to us, um, maybe in some way more than others, and uh, I may go off the mark at some places. And it's very simple, isn't it? At one level, it doesn't need any explanation, I guess. Um, in our lives. But as individuals, there's this recognition that uh, God has given us gifts. God has given us the ability to own things and to have property. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, some people in the New Testament church at the very early stages decided to sell all their property and give it to uh, the cause of Christ. That's fine. That was fine. It wasn't a command for all time. But, uh, property is regarded uh, and, and recognized 
biblically as, as a good thing, our material possessions. But they're not ours to hoard. They're not ours to uh, amass and build up more and more shoes and suits and houses and cars as if that's all that matters. Everything that we own and have, we have in, uh, as stewards almost. We're stewards of it, and we're to use it in a way that is God-glorifying for our cells, our family, to help others, to maintain the state, to support God's work, whatever it is that we do. Um, but we recognize, even within this command, that God uh, respects ownership of property, and that it's okay for that, to have that. And so that for the individual, it's a very simple command, that stealing from other people is wrong. You know, if someone has something and you don't have it and you want it, you don't steal it. Okay, that's fairly simple. And I'm sure you all know that. And I know that. And that's the kind of absolute basic command. You wouldn't go into someone else's house and steal their watch because you liked it and they have it and I don't. Well, I hope you wouldn't. Because if you are, you're breaking this commandment. And uh, that, that's not great. But it's, it's a little bit more, it can be a little bit more subtle than that. I think potentially stealing from employers, or not potentially, but in reality, uh, stealing from our employers is wrong. I think uh, sometimes we can have a very casual attitude towards the time we spend at work, how we spend it at work, what we do with the time that we're at work, uh, and how we potentially abuse that time what we claim from work, what we claim from expenses, um, because it's all socially acceptable. We see it all the time. We see it among our politicians. We see it uh, uh, among our employers. We see it in lots of places that it's okay. It's just up for grabs to get as much as we can from our employers and to gain as much as we can from them. But in many ways, what was attractive, even about Christian slaves in t the time that Titus was in, it was when they were being honest and trustworthy with their employers who were very often, uh, not employers, but those slave traders who were, uh, slave masters who were often uh, brutal and uh, uh, not acting in an acceptable way. But we need to just be aware that the, the Christian walk always challenges us to maybe live in a way that is not socially acceptable. It's, no, we, we don't just put on an extra couple of hours on overtime that we didn't actually work because it's stealing from our employer, because it's not a right to do that, because we have a higher standard than just uh, what everyone else is doing around us because of Christ our Savior and Lord. Stealing from our employers. Maybe even stealing from the state is an application of this taking benefits that we're not entitled to, or uh, avoiding taxes that we should be paying. <sighs> Uncomfortable as we sit in our seats. Again, fair game today. The whole drive of society, and I'm not saying that governments use taxes in the right way, but Jesus said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And if we are to pay tax, even if it's an unfair tax as a Christian, we have the duty to be absolutely honest in all our dealings, even if nobody else sees that. But maybe a more sensitive application is stealing from God Himself, where we steal uh, with uh, an attitude of thanklessness, uh, selfishness, by hoarding what He's gifted to us for ourselves, uh, by not giving back to Him and to the gospel work in proportion to what He's given to us. You know, the, Malachi speaks about that, about the people who were um, robbing God. They were stealing from God because they weren't giving to God what was His due financially, in terms of gospel ministry, gospel work. 
in the New Testament is full of encouragement to give proportionally, to give sacrificially, to give cheerfully, to give happily, because it's God's in the first place. And anything we have is a gift from Him. And uh, so, there's that sense in which you might be stealing from Him. Everything we're earning, we just keep in our pockets and stuff our pockets with it. And if we've got five pence at the end of the month, we'll give that into the, to the work of the gospel. Not recognizing that He wants us to proportionally uh, give from what we are. He doesn't want everything from us. He simply wants us to recognize that what we have is we are stewards of, and He has given us it in the first place. But maybe it's in stealing time from God. Again, that, you know, He's given us uh, so much. He's given us so much, and we're only here for a short time. But He wants us to use that time proportionally as Christians to serve Him, to serve other people, to um, not simply be concerned about our own futures and our own wealth creation and, and our own benefits, but to use our time and our talents and our energies in doing His work and in serving Him, because time is so short. I guess there's a kind of biblical pattern in, in six and one in terms of the, the weekly uh, pattern of life, but I think it goes beyond that because uh, we're to be living sacrifices in, in all that we are. And, of course, uh, in, in terms of stealing from God, they're stealing the glory from God, you know, where we have dethroned Him. We've kicked Him off the throne of our hearts altogether. He's not there, and we're on the throne of our hearts. We're number one. We're all that's important. We live for ourselves and not for God. It's the root of sin, isn't it? It's the root of sin from the very beginning, that we don't need Him. We're not interested in Him. We're stealing from Him the glory that's due to His name uh, because of who He is, the sovereignty of our lives is in our own hands, and we've got no time for allowing Him to be Lord over us. We've rejected the truth. And that, at a very fundamental level, is where the, the commands point us to Jesus. All the commands point us to Jesus, because Jesus fulfilled them in our place where we fail. He acted absolutely perfectly in each situation. He never broke this command practically or mentally or in his mind or anything physically, he absolutely kept this, and God was Lord over his life as he lived as a human being. Uh, and yet he died as one who is a lawbreaker because he was dying in our place. So, we recognize that Jesus is who we need because we break this command uh, in thought and word and in deed by wanting to receive the glory for us, stealing the glory, stealing the time, uh, and maybe in other ways, uh, stealing uh, from God or from our employer or from uh, society or whatever it might be. And so, it always points to a new heart, points to a new attitude, points to a new desire within us that we want to serve in the society we live, not just by society standards, and I think even in today's society, at some levels, stealing is regarded as a crime. But in lots of ways, it's not. If we've seen the way that uh, just uh, decisions are made, it's, uh, it's okay for some to steal, in other words, and maybe not others. And it's easy to pick out the obvious stealers, but maybe there's uh, those who steal who wear fine clothes who uh, are not so easy to expose because society accepts there's, there's a general level of, of uh, deceit and hypocrisy and uh, theft that happens, whether it be through tax uh, evasion or whatever it might be, avoidance. So, there's individuals that this command breaks. And then briefly, can I just mention employers, which may or may not apply to us directly here, uh, but applies to our thinking. And also, lastly, very briefly, governments. So, just employers, because uh, the Bible doesn't just speak about the individual. The Bible also uh, is clear about the, the responsibilities of employers and the responsibilities of society as a whole. Um, 
Uh, in Malachi 3, verse 5, God says, So I will come near to you in judgment against those who defraud laborers of their wages uh, or those who use, in Hosea 12, verse 7, the merchant who uses dishonest scales and who loves to defraud. And the Bible quite often uses that picture of dishonest scales where there was, um, they weighed the scales in a certain way so that uh, you were getting less for what you were paying for. And it was quite subtle. Uh, but there were dishonest scales. And the use of these dishonest scales, false weights and measures, there's a lot in Deuteronomy about the false weights and measures. And it was, def- what it was, it was employers were, uh, or businessmen were, business people were defrauding and cheating on the public so that they could earn more profit. Hmm, that sounds familiar. God sees that. And uh, it is an uncomfortable reality that uh, many of our big businesses are abusing uh, their right to make money because they are doing so in a way that is deceptive. False weights and measures, in some cases, will be being used. Because all of society is broken by sin, and that includes big business. And we need to recognize that in our understanding and thinking of the world in which we live, as is the denial of a proper wage that we read about. The Bible has lots to say about injustice, and it's all very well for us to uh, speak about personal faith and, and poverty being the result of people's bad choices and everything else like that, which we say from the comfort of our middle-class realities. But the Bible speaks about the importance of not denying a proper wage to the worker. The worker is wor- worthy of his hire. Now, we know there's abuses on the labor side, the employment labor side, that is, not the political labor side. Uh, but we know there's also abuses on the employer side. And we recognize that, and we need to recognize that and stand up against it. Because we live in a society where greed and exploitation uh, is hugely acceptable and hugely uh, important. Uh, Modern day uh, slavery, as it were. God despises oppression of the poor. Luke, James 5, verse 4 says, the wages you, the rich people, have failed to pay the workers are crying out against you while you have lived in luxury and self-indulgence. I don't think you can spiritualize that. I don't think you can move away from it being an absolute categorical um, uh, standing against uh, the vast inequalities that we see in the society in which we live. Because as the rich get richer, the poor are getting poorer. And that stands uh, as a great mark of guilt on the day of judgment. There's astonishing figures of the Western world and of the uh, monumental uh, and uh, doubling and trebling and quadrupling of, of wealth of the very top end of society, which is uh, in the backdrop of a great deal of poverty also. And we recognize that human rights uh, and God's will is being broken uh, by that injustice. So employers have a responsibility, as do employees, which I mentioned earlier. So the Bible is very practical, and our Christianity must be very practical. And dare I say it, even our politics need to be practically outworked on the basis, as much as is possible, where we can make choices, make choices that are honoring to God. That's very difficult. I appreciate it. But lastly, and very briefly, I think uh, government is also uh, highly responsible under God not to steal. Uh, How that works out, I'm not quite sure in terms of justice and judgment. Everyone will stand before God as individuals. 
But any time society or government uh, fails to understand and recognize their moral responsibility, then we begin to uh, go down a very dangerous road where people are only potentially economic units, where uh, we recognize in the world in which we live the inequality, the world inequality is a huge problem. Richer countries, as, as individuals, getting richer, poorer countries, getting poorer. Uh, economic systems, which take advantage of natural resources in poor countries and uh, uh, abuse these countries and bleed them dry in order for a certain uh, other sectors in the world to benefit from it. Paying uh, slave wages uh, for high quality sports goods that are sold for vast profit in the West, whereas the workers are not being paid uh, fairly for what they are doing. Where the power of government decisions is not moral, uh, but is based on economic power and economic significance and e economic influence. And I guess kind of modern day colonialism. Um, God says of Assyria, who, an early uh, colonial country in terms of uh, taking over uh, other nations, I have removed. Uh, the boundaries of nations, they said, I have plundered their treasures. God's judgment is that I will punish the king of Assyria for the willful pride of his heart and the haughty look in his eyes. And all of that uh, is constantly something that we see in the world in which we live. Um, very clearly in, in Ukraine at the moment, I guess, at one level. And in the complexity of some of these decisions, we see the commands of God being broken. So we recognize, I guess, what I'm trying to say is we recognize from the commands that they, are, they have a personal application, uh, a very fundamental, basic personal application, but they also are a provision for society. And the reason our society is in such a mess is because we ignore God's commands and we go our own way. And there's a need for a societal repentance and also for individual repentance. And we look for a world and we seek to be in our Christian communities uh, a small reflection of what it is, what it looks like to live God's way. And that means self-denial, and it means self-control, and it means putting Christ first, and knowing His grace, and knowing His forgiveness, and moving forward uh, in His strength and in His power. And it may be that we are challenged by our attitude to work or our attitude to uh, stealing from others or maybe more significantly stealing time and glory from God. Maybe we find forgiveness uh, in our lives and uh, be challenged to think about the world in which we live. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, help us, we pray, to understand uh, the world in which we live. In all its complexity, we know there are no easy answers, and we recognize the, um, the darkness that sin brings us into, both uh, in our economic thinking um, and in our uh, spiritual thinking also, and in our uh, societal thinking. We do know that we live in an age, at least politically, where uh, individualism is very rife and strong in the West. And we know that sometimes that militates against um, others and caring for and uh, loving others and equality. And we pray and ask that you would help us to have a conscience for the poor uh, who make up such a vast number in this world. Um, it almost seems too great a problem, uh, too scary and frightening a problem to deal with, and we can't change this world, but we can change our own attitudes, Lord, 
and our own generosity and our own willingness to uh, share from the undoubted riches and wealth we have proportionally uh, to help those who haven't. And we ask that there would be more honesty and more trust in this world through the gospel and through Christ not abandoning us. And uh, we think what a terrible world this would be without your common grace and without the patience and compassion and grace of God at work. That would be hell indeed. So, Lord, protect us from these things, both in our own hearts and in this world in which we live. And bless us tonight, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.